you know, the methodology of getting from concept to finished product was so empowering to those kids. Hello, and welcome to the Arts of Language podcast with Andrew Poudoua, founder of the Institute for Excellence in Writing, or as many like to say, IEW. My name is Julie Walker, and I'm honored to serve Andrew and IEW as the Chief Marketing Officer. Our goal is to equip teachers and teaching parents with methods and materials which will aid them in training their students to become confident and competent communicators and thinkers. So, Andrew, my role here at IEW, I am the chief marketing officer. And, of course, that gives me uh, plenty of opportunity to either write copy or talk to people about what it is we do here at IEW. And we make some pretty bold claims. Maybe I should say I make some pretty bold claims. For example, what what kind of bold claim do do you make? That our method... The structure and style writing method can be applied to any child, regardless of their age or aptitude. And when I say child, it's actually not children either. It's not limited to children. Adults have learned our structure and style program. So any age or aptitude, and I'm pretty sure that I got that phrase from you. Well, I don't know that it's a bold claim if it is our record of experience. It is, yes. And we do certainly have people all up and down the age and aptitude and academic experience spectrum Mm -hmm. uh, who have reported uh, tremendous results uh, with their kids, with their students, or personally, as you mentioned. Right, yes. And we, of course, not just reach homeschoolers or just classrooms. We're in every pathway of education. One of the things that you and I have talked about in the past is our concern, maybe that's too strong of a word, but we just don't want to be pigeonholed. We're the writing curriculum for boys. We're the writing curriculum for homeschoolers. And you have said in videos before, it's the method for any environment. And so, wow, there's one more thing, not not just age or aptitude, but any teaching environment. Well, and a few weeks ago, we talked about Suzuki method Mm -hmm. and the idea that any child can learn. Right. And it's it's interesting because you see Suzuki method applied in a broad range. You see Suzuki method students among the special needs population. Mm -hmm. You see special, you see Suzuki method students um, in, you know, the the high talent Right side of things. Mm -hmm. You see it in schools. Mm -hmm. You see it in small group instruction. You see it in individual instruction. You see kids starting at, you know, four or five years old. You see kids starting at 14 or 15 or adults starting at 40 or 50. So that's very similar to what we do. It's a pathway and anyone can start on that pathway regardless of aptitude or experience. Right, right. And so... We have had many conversations about helping students with special needs, dyslexia, dysgraphia, maybe ADHD, some of these children that would be, consp- would be considered special ed. But we have not had too many conversations about what you mentioned, the gifted and talented students. So can IEW, can the structure and style writing method be applied to parents and teachers who are working with gifted and talented students. That's oh, our theme for today. Yeah, absolutely. I I think the term is heard less frequently mm-hmm. today than it would have been a few decades ago. I think parents and teachers are less prone to label children, mm-hmm. but there is that contingent of kids whom everyone knows. Mm-hmm. They have... A great brain, and they have a lot of information, and they love to play with that. And and sometimes you see that combined with 
say, a dyslexia or dysgraphia. Right. And that can be extremely frustrating because you, it's, it's there. It's mm-hmm. there. Just can't get it out. But, uh, you know, I do meet uh, a number of people whose basic desire is to help a talented child writer to make the most of that. Mm-hmm. You know, how mm-hmm. do you really give them the greatest opportunity based on the gifts they have? Mm-hmm. And so, and we've seen that in our uh, filming of the SSS, right? I mean, we definitely had some kids who came in and, uh, you know, there wasn't much I could do to cultivate their zeal Mm -hmm. or their imagination because there were a few that just walked in with it. Right. What was delightful, of course, was to see how the tools of the structural models, the stylistic techniques, you know, the methodology of getting from concept to finished product was so empowering Mm -hmm. to those kids. Yeah. So talk about that. And, you know, I'm going to mention him by name just so that if there's any parents or teachers looking at the level C class, we had a very talented writer in there, Nathan. Mm -hmm. And he came in and I wondered if he he did the assignments because he was on camera and there was pressure there, or if he truly enjoyed it. I think the latter. I think he really loved having you as his teacher. I think he wanted to perform well for you. There's air quotes there, perform well for you. And I think his I think his writing did improve, even though he already came in with so much. Sure. So talk about that a little well, bit. Well, um, a couple things. You know, that's a gradual process. Mm-hmm. His little testimonial that's hanging on our bulletin board here mm-hmm. was, when I started this, I didn't like it. Uh, doesn't mean he didn't have aptitude. You know, he had good vocabulary, lots and lots of general knowledge and experience. And, you know, he had been surrounded by the quality of language that would allow him to kind of easily say, does that sound good? Mm-hmm. You know, yep. Does that sound right? Does that sound interesting? And And I think most of us get to that point where we're really saying, does it sound right? And and that means we're comparing what we're reading against our whole lifetime of experience with English language mm-hmm. and seeing, you know, does it fit? Mm-hmm. For younger children who have less of a lifetime of experience, it's harder for them to do that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you see a student like Nathan, and I think we could – you know, name a few more. Oh, Josiah, definitely. Jack. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And then, of course, lots of the girls were basically able to do that. And so with those two elements in place, the gift of the aptitude experience, the the richness of language that somehow they had furnished in their mind, mm-hmm. been furnished for them, and then the methodology. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, You know, one of the things that I get, and it kind of pertains to this, is, you know, I've been thinking about AW. I have this, you know, fill in the blank, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 14, right? Boy, girl, Mm -hmm. fill in the blank, Mm -hmm. who just loves writing, Mm -hmm. you know, writes in her free time. Uh, He's working on a, a novel. What can I do? And in that case, it's interesting because the parent feels like, Already, this child's aptitude is beyond their capacity for coaching. Right. And short of finding a, you know, a published, experienced, seasoned author who's willing to mentor, mm-hmm. you know, a young teenager, it's hard to get that, to find that. But what we have discovered is that with the discipline of following the structural models and all the associated little elements and rules – working with the checklist over a period of a few years, that adds to that great kind of database of language that may have been somewhat randomly collected up and helps to organize and label so that a child can say, oh, I can do that and I can read it and know that it works. It's Mm -hmm. stylish. It's Mm -hmm. effective. And so, you know, that's where we're, we're trying to go. Uh, so a lot of times people say, will it stifle? You know, will will the IEW method stifle the creativity of my kid who loves writing? 
And the answer is I have never, ever heard of that happening. Not right. even one instance. It's the opposite. It, it's more toys in the toy box or tools in the toolbox. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I think about, you know, that student that the parent is concerned or the teacher is concerned, will this methodology stifle their creativity? I think if they're taking cues from the students, initially, especially the gifted and talented students, initially, they're going to find it way too easy, like a keyword outline and telling it back. How, how does that help me become more creative in the future? Yeah, I, don't, I haven't actually had anyone ever say this is too easy. Mm -hmm. You know, even adults who have tremendous, like, careers writing behind them mm -hmm. come to the teacher training course and say, wow, this is an interesting idea. But I've never had anyone say it's too easy. It's mm -hmm. maybe different than what they did before. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you poll students and you say, if you make an outline first – and then write from your outline, generally, does the writing turn out better than if you skip the outline step and just start writing? And if they're honest, you know, I think we're talking high 90% of the time, they'll say, well, yes, I don't like necessarily doing the outline, but it does help a lot. It separates complexity. Well, and one of the things that you mention when you're talking about keyword outlines, for example, in Unit 5, you ask the students – is it okay to deviate from this keyword outline? And it's kind of a rhetorical question. The answer is, well, yes. Sure. But sure. giving them permission to do so, it's almost like you have to do that. Otherwise, some of these kids will be want to do it exactly the way they did it with you in class. Which is fine, too. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm wanting – and this is part of the trick of teaching – an environment with a wider range of mm -hmm. aptitudes or experience is you want to give everyone an opportunity to be, well, essentially at the easy plus one level, mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. the idea of I'm comfortable with almost all of this or I'm comfortable with all of this. And at the same time, you don't want them to say, you know, I am constrained by that. I now have a better idea than the one I had 10 minutes ago. Mm -hmm. But that's happened to all, it? all mm -hmm. of us, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, yep. oftentimes we, you know, we think about something and where we end is so far better than where we started. And that's yep. going to happen with kids too. Yep. So uh, for those kids who need to say, okay, I have the outline. Now all I have to do is put those words into sentences and I'll get done with this thing versus the kid who says, oh, I got such a better idea now. I really have to go with it. Mm -hmm. And so if we, if we allow for both of those to happen in the teaching environment, then both will be challenged at that appropriate plus a little bit, you know, easy plus a little bit appropriateness. What would you say to that classroom teacher who's got a handful of students that are just ready to take off? And how do you differentiate instruction and challenge those Higher level students. Well, we have some good resources for teachers on that. We generally call it kind of filtering. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, each unit allows you kind of a fresh start to do something together with everyone. So, you know, the month ticks over, February hits, you're in unit six or wherever. You're going to say, okay, new unit, everyone do all of this together. And so you've taken you know, a person or an animal or a place, and then you find a topic and you find a source text, and that's what we also provide in our yes. materials. And but, I love that. So whenever there's a new unit, you keep everybody together. Yeah, bring everyone together. You've got the new idea of source outlines and creating a fused outline. Mm -hmm. After the fused outline, then it's pretty much the same as Unit 4. So those students who were doing well and feeling confident and mostly independent at the end of Unit 4 – will become quickly that way mm -hmm. with the unit six. In in a group of many children, you do kind of have to chunk them. And so first lesson, everyone together. Okay, now you've got your hotshot kids and you say, mm -hmm. okay, I think you get the hang of this. Do you want to try one yourself or do you want to do one more with us? Mm -hmm. You know, most of them are going to say, I'll do it myself. Say, okay, here's the source text. You go do it yourself. Mm hmm we're going to do it over here together. If you want to listen in, if you need a little help, no problem. So they go off 
either working in small groups or independently, either mm-hmm. one. Mm-hmm. And how many do you have? Two, three, four, five, I don't know, six. Mm-hmm. And then you teach the next lesson to everybody. And then you've got your next group down and they're kind of like, okay, I got this. Okay. So now for a third assignment, you do it independently and I'll do one more all the way through together with whoever wants to join in. Mm-hmm. And then you get your group that needs the more repetition and you do a third or even maybe a fourth. Maybe that group still needs your help all the way to the end of February through every Unit 6 assignment. But that's okay. Uh, you're not expecting nor do you – should you become frustrated if every child doesn't reach complete confidence and independence in one unit of time. That's not, you know, that's not something you can make happen. Mm-hmm. You can simply nourish the growth mm-hmm. where it is and hope then that this continues on, you know, in the future with the next teacher or a different class or a different situation. If you're homeschool, it's kind of convenient because you get the same teacher. get the same students every year. Mm -hmm. So that filtering idea, Mm -hmm. um, one of the tools that we recommend for that dynamic is having a file box Mm -hmm. of source text. Mm -hmm. So at some point, you don't even give the students the source text. You just say, over there is a box of source texts. Mm -hmm. There's sets of mini books. There's sets of, you know, stories, whatever Mm -hmm. unit you're in. Mm -hmm. Go get one and do this whole thing through yourself. Right. And you may or may not get there this year, but you're prepared in case you do have a few hot shots. Right. And one of the things that you, I don't know if you stated it directly, but certainly alluded to that in this classroom environment, if they're doing the structure and style methodology in the school, in the school program, they're going to do unit six again next year. Exactly. And it may be that, yes, everybody does that first lesson together, but those hot shots may be go right into those file box sources sooner. Yeah, and it depends. Not all teachers are going to have organized that in the mm-hmm. same way. Right. But just keeping in mind that idea that and, – and you saw me do this in the SSS. Basically, I said – and the kids weren't organized conveniently geographically in terms of hot shots over here and <laughs> no. everybody else over there. <laughs> but I did say, you know, if you want to do this with us, mm-hmm. you can – and you can copy down what I do on the board. Mm-hmm. If you want to do this on your own, you can kind of just ignore mm-hmm. me, ignore all of what we do, grab one idea here or there, but don't feel compelled right. to do the same thing as, as I am. Right. Then what I find is you, you get a natural comfortability. The kids who want, they've got an idea, they want to run with it, especially if it's unit five or seven, they want to go crazy. Absolutely. Let, let them. And then the kids who are like, but I wouldn't know what to do if mm-hmm. I was on my own. Hey, let's just do it together one mm-hmm. more time. Mm-hmm. And then that builds the confidence and gradually get to that critical mass of I think I can do this. Mm-hmm. But uh, I guess, you know, if there was one bit of wisdom I would pass on to a younger teacher is you cannot force mastery. You cannot make every student in your class, independent in what you want them to be independent in, according to your ideal schedule. Mm -hmm. Right. You you can simply hold the vision that they will get there and then take the next right step. But, you know, trying to force someone to do something without enough help for them to be successful can be kind of dangerous because then they feel, okay, I really – blew that and I failed or maybe even that's compacted with a a bad grade Mm -hmm. when all they really needed was just a little more help, a few more ideas, a couple ways to phrase things, and they would have got past that. So I'm I'm reminded, Andrew, actually of a situation when I was in a classroom. I was a fifth grader and it was a fifth, sixth classroom. And I was actually able to go into the sixth grade math book and boy, didn't I feel special. There were only a couple of us fifth graders that were allowed to do that sixth grade level math, which is so ironic right now because I don't consider myself to be a math (laughs) person. But I would think that there's some motivation there for the students who want to be 
filtered into this higher level of thinking and learning. Sure. You know, it's interesting you went to a mixed age classroom Mm -hmm. because they are uh, not common today, Mm -hmm. although there are a few, a very few I'm aware of, schools that intentionally use mixed age classrooms. However, in a way, it is an easier environment for especially students who want to move faster and do more, mm-hmm. to be able to do that without a, you know, a, a stigma or a, an emotional baggage coming along. Mm-hmm. So if you're in just a fifth grade class and you get to do sixth grade math, that's an entirely different social mm-hmm. situation right. than if you're in a grade five, six combo class and some of the fifth graders do you know, sixth grade math. And, mm-hmm. I mean, it's even possible some of the sixth graders doing fifth grade math. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know that that had happened. Maybe I, it did. <laughs> I, yeah, I don't know either. But it reminds me, you know, of Webster describing mm-hmm. the one-room schoolhouse mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and how, and we've talked about this on other podcasts, how that was really an environment that allowed each child to operate in different, you know, subjects or skills areas according to their individuality. Mm -hmm. Uh, So a student who, you know, had a great aptitude for math, uh, just because he was nine years old, didn't mean he couldn't be doing, you know, grade four or grade five or grade six Mm -hmm. math. Mm -hmm. It it also meant that a student who, you know, was needing more repetition in order to learn spelling words, for example. Right. Um, could stay in a particular grade speller Mm -hmm. until they had mastered that speller, regardless of their chronological age. And so, and I always like to reference that book, Understood Betsy. Mm -hmm. Um, It's just such a charming book, especially as a read aloud if you have, you know, kids that age, especially like a eight-year-old girl, nine-year-old girl. It's just one of the best. But she moves from the city to the country. And the it's, the country is a one-room schoolhouse, and the teacher says, "Oh, do some, you know, do some reading for me, do some spelling for me, do some sums for me." And then she says, "Well, I think you can be, you know, in grade two here, and you can do this with the grade threes, and you can do this with your grade fours. And her question at the end of the chapter is, "But what grade am I in?" Right. Right. You know. Yeah. And so, in in a way, there's a freedom for children to excel as well as a safety for children who need more opportunity or repetition. Mm -hmm. And everyone can proceed uh, in that environment without the social weirdness of everybody being the same grade and having to think they have to do all the same things exactly the same way. Right. And, of course, you know, a homeschool is kind of like a one-room schoolhouse, but with a whole lot less challenges of <laughs> numbers of kids per teacher and, in Webster's case, no electricity in Saskatchewan in the winter. <laughs> oh, my. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, you mentioned the filtering as a strategy, certainly, and I'm thinking about just how we how we label our materials. We don't we don't have a third grade writing, fourth grade writing. We kind of have this range of right. level A is generally third to fifth grade reading level. And there's nothing on that cover that makes it look like it's really young exactly. or really old. So it's we just... have people who, you know, call up and say, you know, I have a a 10-year-old mm-hmm. who reads super well, mm-hmm. you know, read anything, loves writing. Could I do the level B? Absolutely. Or in the opposite, you know, I have a high school student who's really has had a hard time with it and you know she's 14 but Mm -hmm. you know Mm -hmm. reading level is can I do level A right yeah absolutely right that's I think one of the greatest things about the way we have organized our materials even though it's a little bit frustrating to people who come out of a system and Mm -hmm. say well I need to have a the sixth grade Mm -hmm. material or the yep. third grade material. And if that's you, listener, just know that you can call our customer service team and they will coach you and help you choose the right level for your student. Yeah. One more thing um, I would mention about smart smart kids, ju- mm-hmm. using the sense of gifted, talented, high aptitude, mm-hmm. they often also tend to be uh, kind of willful in some ways. Like, mm. I want to do it the way I want to do it. Oh, very interesting. And so in that case, you know, 
you sometimes have to say, well, okay, that's good. What we're trying to learn are these things here. So that's why I want you to follow these rules.、Mm-hmm. Not because it'll necessarily make a better story or a better article or, or essay, or whatever, at the moment. But in doing this, in following the discipline, you will become a better writer. Much like someone who wants to dance isn't going to be thrilled with the you know, years of beginning exercises that maybe need to be practiced along with、mm-hmm. other things.、Mm-hmm. Uh, in order to reach a higher ability at dance. So,、mm-hmm. and you can make sports analogies or art analogies, cooking analogies.、Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> uh, and then the last thing I would squeeze in is that oftentimes those types of kids are enthusiastic or can be led to be interested or excited about entering. Contests. Oh, uh huh.、Uh, you know, an essay contest, a story writing contest,、um, you know, history contest. There's lots of them, and、mm-hmm. we from time to time keep, you know, putting them out there. Every time I see an essay contest,、mm-hmm. I'll put it on my Facebook page. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and th- there's something about, okay, I'm now going to submit this essay or story or whatever, and the people judging it. Don't know me.、Mm-hmm. There's kind of a like a testing of your metal、mm-hmm. at that point,、mm-hmm. you know, and it's very, very good, very, very healthy. And、um, oftentimes, a student, you know, can have an unexpected honorable mention or second place or maybe first place. And that just goes such a long way to validating everything my mom taught me, you know, everything I learned in school from my teacher is really. Applicable, immediately、mm-hmm. helpful、mm-hmm. when I have to do this task in a different world. Right, right. Andrew, this whole, this whole podcast that we've ta- been talking about, you know, scaling assignments for students, and I'd like to end with this.、Uh, we've not yet mentioned our checklist generator and the ability to make the easy plus one in the stylistic techniques scalable for these older students. Or not older, but, you know, smart yes, students. Yes. A chief marketing officer would always remember you've got to point people to the things that help. Well, <laughs> yes.、Uh, yeah, the checklist generator is one of the tools that we offer in being able to adjust, extend extra challenge to the kids who need extra challenge,、mm-hmm. and simplify and condense for the kids who need that.、Mm-hmm. Uh, so, that along with The reading level of the source texts, along with the filtering idea, and then the teacher always being available. Yes. You know, to help, I think is, is critical. And a lot of、uh, teachers who have had kids in five day a week classrooms, and now those kids are in remote learning situation,、mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. a lot of them have realized that, wow, it It is very helpful for a parent or a caregiver you know, that's going to be with the child、mm-hmm. to understand okay, what are the goals? What's this method about?、Mm-hmm. How, can, how can that parent assist the child in doing the best job? And I, I think that's、uh, you know, kind of an interesting shift、mm-hmm. uh, that has come along with the change in dynamic and the way kids are experiencing. Classes,、um, you know, both full time, five day a week, as well as, you know, two day a week, one day a week types、mm-hmm. of things. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you, Andrew. This has been super helpful. I, I hope that teachers and parents who have these children won't shy away from our structure and style methodology. I do believe what I started out by saying that IEW, the structure and style writing method, is something that can be applicable to. Any age, any aptitude, any classroom environment. Yeah. So it might even be the best way. The best way to teach <laughs> writing. I would say so. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks so much for joining us. If you enjoyed this episode and want to hear more, you can subscribe to this podcast in iTunes 
Google Play, or Stitcher. Or just visit us each week at IEW.com slash podcast. Until then, on behalf of Andrew Pudua and the team at IEW, I thank you for allowing us to partner with you on your journey toward better listening, speaking, reading, writing, and thinking.